It's good, to, it's good to see everyone this evening. Thank you for being here. I also like to thank those of, uh, of you who are joining us online. Thank you for, uh, for being with us. Uh, we're always, uh, they occasionally we, we'll ask, I say we, the elders will ask about what kind of viewership that we have online and how many people are watching and and it's always very nice to know that we have a we have a fairly large audience quite often uh, uh, people who are uh, watching the classes and who are watching the lessons on Sunday and stuff and so uh, we're, we're glad we can do that and if, if you are watching us online please as I always say please feel free to join us any opportunity that you have and uh, be a part of the service here we will be in uh, Acts chapter 9 starting this evening Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 is a, <clears throat> you know, there's, when, we'll, we'll quite often say things like, this is a familiar story to you, or, or this is something that we all know. And, and, Acts, and, and if we say that, and that's kind of this level, Acts chapter 9 is kind of, that kind of that little bit even more so that we're familiar with because there's 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 some th- some important things that that happen in Acts chapter nine and of course uh, Acts chapter nine we will see the conversion of Saul Saul of Tarsus and we know who is who is going to be uh, later on it's going to be referred to as Paul. What do you, why do you think that this is what we're about to read here? kind of sets it apart from other... I mean, we, we've been reading up to this point, and, and that's what we like so much about the book of Acts. The book of Acts gives us a good number of conversions of these, these, people, are, these people here and they're baptized, and these people here and they are baptized, and, and we get a good number of conversions in the book of Acts. You can just start at the front and you can just keep going chapter after chapter after chapter of, of different conversions. What kind of sets chapter 9 with the conversion of Saul? What makes it, I guess, why we kind of think of this conversion quite often when we're, when we're talking about conversions? What kind of sets it apart from the others? All right. Uh, Kevin said what he was doing before and after. The, one, of the, one of the things that, that we... It's very obvious. We, up to this point in time, it's not like, you know, when we're reading about some of the other people that are converted, we really don't know their, their history or their background, do, they? do we? I mean, here's a person, they hear the gospel, they believe, uh, they're baptized, they, uh, they are a part of the church, but we don't know a lot of their history. Saul is kind of an exception to that. We've already heard about Saul, and from the very first time we hear about Saul at the stoning of Stephen, that kind of sets the stage for what kind of person he is, right? I mean, he is not... Well, from our standpoint, there's a couple of ways we can look at this. From our standpoint, he's not your innocent neighbor who just doesn't know the gospel. We wouldn't classify him as our innocent neighbor that just doesn't know the gospel. He's a good man. He's a good moral man. He just doesn't know the gospel. From a Christian standpoint, he's not the good neighbor. (laughs) He's not who I want as my neighbor. Not from a Christian standpoint. He is, as, as, as the scriptures say in the King James Version, he's making havoc of the Christians. He's destroying them. He, when he has opportunity, he, he not only imprisons... I mean, putting you in prison, that's one thing, but he, he goes further than that, doesn't he? He's not just only imprisoning people, but he's doing what? There's persecution, there's torture, and there's, there's death. And he is actively... He, it's not like, well, I do that when I get a chance. He's doing what? At, at the start of chapter 9, he's doing what? He is 
actively endeavoring to go to... He, he's, hey, he is... Ex, where's this persecution start? It starts in Jerusalem. But what is Saul doing? He's extending that sphere of persecution, isn't he? Hey, I, the persecution started in Jerusalem. And so what did the Christians do that were in Jerusalem? They scattered. Well, if they left town, I'm going to do what? I'm going to go find them. I'm going to track them down. He's a bounty hunter, right? I'm going to track them down. I'm going to bring them back to Jerusalem. So we do know something about him. And all that we know about him, previous conversion. I don't actually have to see a show of hands. How many people would have thought, there's the guy that we need? I mean, how, how many people, if you lived in, would you have been the guy who said, you know what? I think that Saul guy... He probably just really misunderstands what we're all about. I think I'm going to go sit down and have a little talk with him. See if I can enlighten him. Maybe I can help him out a little. Maybe, maybe I can get him to see it our way. No, I, I don't know about you. I don't, I don't think I'd have been getting in the front of the line to say, let me go talk to him. So everything we know about him is not just... And we don't want to say there is... Then I don't want to say there's bad sin and worse sin, right? You know, in the scriptures, sin, sin, right? But if there is an enemy of Christ, and then there's enemies of Christ, and Saul falls into that category of he is an enemy of Christ, and he's doing everything he can to stop the way, as, as he's as going to be referred to here. And then afterwards, is there, when we read in the Scriptures, and I know we don't have, as John says, there's many other things that happen that we don't have. But these are written that we might believe. But, but from what we read in the letters that we have, and is there anybody that we read about on the other side that is more zealous than Paul proclaiming the gospel. You know, when you, read, when you read some secular history and you read about the apostles and how they died and their martyrdom and, and how they were killed, a lot of, most of that is secular history. We read, we read in, in, in Fox's Book of Martyrs, of here's how, but we really don't see those in the Scriptures, do we? But as far as physical torment and physical torture and hardships and everything, do we read about anybody who suffers more than Paul does? Or anybody who is as zealous as Paul is and what he does? I mean, most of, the, most of the readings that we read are from who? They're from Paul. And so as Kevin said, one of the things that kind of sets this conversion different than some of the rest is, wow, what he was before and what he was after. And so we read that and that's, that's one of the instances that we look at and... and and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of lessons we can get from that. One of the lessons easily from that just because, because of that change is what a difference Christ makes in someone's life. Now, from the Jew's standpoint, the non-Christian Jew, from the Jew's standpoint, non-Christian, what kind of man was Saul? How, how would they have felt of him? What did they think about him? Man, you want to talk about a go-getter. He, he's out there stomping out this perversion. We've got this group out there who is trying to pervert the prophets and the law. They're teaching things that we no longer have to obey by the law. We no longer have to do all of these things. And he's out there st stomping it out. He's putting them to death. He's trying to keep 
our religion pure. Very good. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Lee said something about the idea we often see in the, in the Scriptures where the Pharisees are, are talked about as being hypocritical. Saul wasn't hypocritical. If the Scriptures said these people who disobey and this should be punishable by death, and he's going to do it. So there is, there is such a difference between the man before and the man after. And Christ makes that difference. I think, well, let's put it on our own level. I think all of us probably know somebody, and maybe the somebody is you, that the life you lived pre-Christian to post-Christian is really different. It may not be as drastic as what we see between Saul and Paul. But there's a difference. And we know people like that. We know we, we ourselves may be that kind of person, that there's a, there's a big change from, from one point to the other. So one of the things that we get out of this is just seeing such a drastic change from lifestyles before and after. Anything else that, that stands... that makes this stand out as, as, as a conversion we look at quite often. Ben's talking about, he said, it, in modern times we quite often hear people who they, they are bound and determined they're going to prove the Scriptures wrong. They're going, to, they're going to show those places where it contradicts itself, that it can't possibly be true, and they, and they make that their, their mission. They're going, to, they're going to do that, and through their study, and the more they work on it, they, it just doesn't, it doesn't come together like that. And, uh, and then they end up being Christians because of, of what they have found. And I think that's true if anybody goes into it open-minded to, to look at it and give it, give it its free course, uh, that, that conviction can be there. All right, anything else that kind of stands out about this, this whole conversion? All right, just a second. George? Okay. All right, Frank? One of the things that we want to... that. I want us to think about just for a second. And all these conversions that we have come to up to this point, and including this one, does Jesus... Is, is Jesus the person of conversion? Is Jesus the person who delivers the message that conversion comes through? No. We've actually had a couple of... Th we've, we've had angels in here too, right, hadn't we? Have angels ever gone and taught a person what they needed to do for salvation? This is a bad one. So whose job is that? <laughs> Amy. <laughs> Amy's going to lay it on us. Here am I, send me. It, it, it's our job. Jesus doesn't convert. He doesn't, he, he doesn't convert Saul here. He, he says, as we get into the story, you know the story. Go into the city and what? Somebody's going to tell you. Couldn't have Jesus? I mean, he, I mean, Jesus is talking to him right there. Couldn't he have said, Saul, I'm sending a man to you and here's what you need to do. That doesn't happen. Nor do angels do it. The message of the gospel has been left to you and me to do. That's our job. 
Our job is to spread the gospel. Any, yes, Scotty. Every time. Scotty said that if you, if you look af- after, the, after the crucifixion of Christ and he's gone back, it, there is somebody put in place to do the teaching. All right, anything else with this before we go on? Anything else you want to mention about it before we move into this story? One of the things that I like to see in this story is... There, there's, there's a period of time here where Saul, there's no doubt by reading in the Scriptures, there's a period of time here where Saul is truly repentant. He's truly sorrowful. But, and, and, that, and that in it, bless you, and that in itself plays a part of, of what sometimes is talked about in the religious world today. The conversion of Saul is so clear-cut of what's involved in salvation and, and what, part, what part do these things play. And so uh, let's look at it. We're, we're in chapter 9. We'll start with verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter... Now, folks, slaughter... That doesn't sound like it's a minor thing. And breathing out slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, and this is the first time that Christianity is referred to as this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He's not a respecter of persons here, is he? Uh, you know, it, it's one thing, you know, quite often in history when you see one army attacking another army or there's some kind of confrontation going on, it's not uncommon for the men to be destroyed because they are the warriors. But usually, a lot of times, who gets spared? Well, the women get spared. He doesn't care. I don't care whether you're a man or a woman. If you are of the way, I'm bringing you back to Jerusalem. And again, one of the things we mentioned last week, Saul is not just your average ordinary guy off the street. He goes in and he asks letters. He goes in and he asks letters from the high priest and he is granted those letters. And I, not just anybody could go in and say, here's what I want. These letters give him authority to bind somebody in another city and bring them back to Jerusalem. Now, I know at this time, isn't, isn't this, this part of the world, aren't they, aren't they under Roman rule? So what's, what's Saul doing going to, the, going to the high priest and asking these kind of things? What was kind of the deal between the Romans and the Jews at this time? <laughs> hey, those religious things, y'all kind of do your own thing. But now if it's, if it's going to conflict with Roman law, if in some way it's going to conflict with Roman law and cause us problems, then we're, we're going to have a say. So a matter of fact, with the time that they're looking forward to crucifying Christ, what is one of the concerns between, about, from the high priest and, and that group? What is, what is their concern? If we don't get these things under control, what's going to happen? The Romans will come and take away... Because the Romans will say, man, things are out of control and you're not keeping it in control. If you can't do it, guess what? We will. We'll come take, we'll come take, a, we'll come take the authority and we'll take care of it. So, the, so they were very conscious of the fact of 
there's a separation between Rome and the Jewish law and Jewish religion. And as long as these twos didn't conflict, we're okay. But you better, you better make sure it doesn't, because if it doesn't, then the Rome is going to come in and take over. So, so Saul goes to, and because this is a religious matter. They're violating religious law. And so he goes and he, he gets these letters, and they're granted unto him. And he's going to go bind them, and he's going to bring them back to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now when he refers here and he says, Lord, the, 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 when he uses the term Lord here, he's not thinking of it as Lord like we think of Lord Most High. This he's saying when he's saying Lord, he's saying, like us saying, Sir, who is, you know, and that's why he goes on, who is this? And that's why he identified and says, I'm Jesus. And of course, I'm sure we all know, sure that Saul is, I mean, this is who he is fighting against those who will follow after Jesus. So it's not like he's going to go, Jesus who? I mean, he... <laughs> and he trembled and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. This make an impression upon him in more than one way. Think about this. How confident, pre this, before this, how confident do you think Saul, what kind of a man do you think he is confidence-wise? How confident do you have to go to go into the high priest and say, look, I need you to give me some letters to go to, to go to Damascus. I'm going over there to arrest some people. I'm going to put them in bonds. I'm going to bring them back here. We're going to have them tortured. We're going to have them possibly killed. To carry that kind of authority around, I don't see Saul as a soft-spoken, please, I, hey, it, if you don't mind, I'd like to put you in bonds and take you back to Jerusalem. I don't see that happening, do you? Man, this, this man is a man of power and authority. I think he's the type of man that when he walks through the crowd, he's noticed. Later on when we're talking, <laughs> when Ananias is told to go, I mean, what's his comment? <laughs> oh, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I've heard of this man. When, when uh, Saul, Paul, when he comes to Jerusalem, who has, to, who has to run interference for him? Barnabas. Barnabas has to run interference for him because what are, how do the other apostles feel? We know about this guy. I think Saul's the man that when he walked into the room, all eyes turned towards him. He was a man of position. He was a man of power. He was a man of authority. And he's going down to get these people and drag them back. How does he enter Damascus? Humbled. Fearful. And he's being led by the hand because he's physically blind. If we want to look at that alone, this man was the leader. 
he was out front. He was the man leading the pack. And now what is he? He's humbled and he's being led by the hand because he's helpless. We want to talk about a change. That in itself is a big change. And what has he been told to do? Verse 6, Go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. The only thing at this point that he's told is, Go to the city. That's what he's been told. And you'll be told what to do. Well, and if we want to go with the King James, you'll be told what thou must do. We put in that word there, that must makes it kind of what? You, <laughs> you really don't got a choice here, buddy. Verse 7, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and he didn't eat or drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man and how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he ha and here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. I have heard he, he's here in town. Matter of fact, just speculation. Saul's coming to He's coming here to arrest people to take them back, right? I wonder if Ananias is one of those that he was going to arrest. Who knows? <laughs> if he'd have found him, he'd say, thank you, Glenn. Glenn said, if he had found him, he would have. He said, he said Lord, I've heard of this man. I mean, this is common knowledge because he, he gives the details. He has letters. He has letters for him to bind people and take them back. Do what? Yes. Very, yeah, yeah. Definite, definite some fear. Do what? Yes. I mean, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's people who have, prob have already left Jerusalem. They know what's fixing to happen, and they, they've left Jerusalem, and he's, he's, he's behind them. Basically, he says, Lord, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Lord, are you sure? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, this is not this is not the word that, that he's getting from other people, is it? And the Lord tells him, says, "Yes, I'm sure. He is a chosen vessel. I got a mission for him." I've got a mission for him. And my mission is this, 
First of all, He's going to do what? He's going to be my voice to the Gentiles. Now we know at this point, the Gentiles haven't, been, haven't, been, haven't really been partakers of this in to any big extent, have they? I said, He's going to be my voice to the Gentiles first. He's also going to do what? He's going to stand and proclaim my name where? He's going to stand and proclaim my name before kings. And he's also going to do what? He's going to proclaim my name before Israel. Paul is a chosen vessel to carry out a message. And I'm going to tell you what his message is. Is broad sweeping. There, there's nobody left out. There's nobody left out. You got Israel. You got Gentiles. And matter of fact, so far up as to he will he will speak my name before kings. But what comes along with that? And I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Later on when we read in his letters and Paul is giving defense of himself because later on we know there are those who are going to badmouth Paul and, and, and say some things about his authority and all these kind of things. And we read where, where Paul talks about these are the things that I've gone through. He, he talks about what he's given up. He talks about what he's gone through. And yet, what is, what is the, the, the common thread when he talks about what I've suffered and what I've given up? What, what, is, what is his thought about those things? It's well worth it. What I'm going to receive is far more important than what I've suffered through. The glory that I'm going to receive is, is better than the hardship. You know, all of us have had... All of us at times or another, at one level or another, have gone through some things that were hardships. And when we got through them, we go, you know what? That was worth it. It was worth it. And Paul, later on, he, he talked, he, it's worth it. What I'm receiving in return is far worth what I had to give up. It's, it's far more important than what I had to struggle and go through. He said, I'm going to tell him what he's going to have to suffer for my cause. Verse 17, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightst receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now we, we, we have this account. Now this is the account that, that Luke is writing. Later on there's two other places where it talks about where Luke is writing. Luke here is telling the audience what, what happened. Later on, Luke is going to record Paul telling what? Paul telling what happened. And when you put them all together, you get... Because you know, we, when, we, when we have Paul talking about it, Paul says, and he said what? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Here it just says he, he's, his eyes are healed and he was what? Baptized. Now, you and I both know... That's obviously from, from point A, eyes healed, to point B, being baptized. There had to be something in there, right? He didn't just have his eyes open and go, you know, how, how about baptism? That didn't just pop in his head, hey, how about... No. Now... Obviously, the point that we want to make and, and that has been made many times from the pulpit is from the road to Damascus to this house here is Saul repentant? Most definitely. 
When he talks to Ananias and he says, when he goes and says, when, when he gets there, what, what, is, what is Saul doing? He hasn't eaten, he hasn't drank anything. What's he been doing? He's been praying. And yet, what do we find? He's been praying. There's nobody more repentant. He knows Jesus. And yet, when we put, when we put all three of them together, we find out what? He's still lacking something. Because when Jesus told him on the way, he said, I'm going to send somebody to you who's going to do what? Tell you what you need to do. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. How long did it take Saul to turn around and start saying, Christ is the Son of God? Tell you what I'm going to need to do. Now that I'm one of you, you know what would be best? I need to go back to Jerusalem and get with the other apostles and need to spend some time studying with them. Kind of get caught up on some things. Well, what was he preaching in the synagogues? He was preaching what he knew. That Jesus Christ was what? The Son of God. And matter of fact, he, he's very effective in what he's delivering with them. Uh, <laughs> he must have. You've got to watch him teach so. yourself. <laughs> Verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in, G in Jerusalem and came here for the intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? Isn't this the, isn't this the same guy? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Now how, let me ask you real quick, how could Saul prove that Jesus was the Christ? Thank you. I mean, if there was somebody, uh, remember we're talking about a learned, educated man in the law and the prophets. He could take the law and the prophets just like Matthew does and said, this man is the Christ. <laughs> He's doing a really good job, verse 23. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Seems to be the thing the Jews jump to a lot here, don't they? If I can't stop them, I need to do what? You can't stop them, kill them. That, that Jesus guy, we killed him. That Stephen guy, we killed him. This guy, and matter of fact, this guy, he needs, to be, he needs to be killed for one reason. He's a traitor. He's a traitor to the cause. He was our biggest ally. He was our biggest hope in stomping this stuff out and now he's preaching it. We need to kill him. But their laying wait was known of Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. I'd say they're fairly serious, aren't they? They didn't say if we run across him, we're going to kill him. They're watching. that. They, they got, they've got a sentry at the gate. They watch it all day and they watch it all night. We're going to get him. <laughs> there 
Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he was waited to join himself the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. I will just stop right there. Between now and next week, see if you can find out. It says that he stayed in Damascus several days preaching and teaching. Then he goes from there to Jerusalem where Barnabas is going to intervene for him with the apostles. See if you can get me some kind of timeline of what kind of time are we talking about. Damascus and how much time are we talking from Damascus to, to Jerusalem kind of thing. Amy, don't be telling everybody. Amy knows. Don't ask her. Oh, Frank, Frank, Frank showed her. Okay. Okay. <laughs> See if you can get me a timeline of, of what kind of time we're talking here.
Good evening. Our first song tonight will be a song called Hear My Cry. It's the one we've been practicing on the singing bee. So we'll see if we can get through it. Then for our song after the lesson, we'll sing In Need. In Matthew chapter 22, the chapter begins by saying, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said. And he tells a parable that goes down through verse 14, but we're not going to read it in its entirety because I want to focus on one phrase as we think about Christ's invitation to Christianity tonight. But he begins by saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who were invited and, and stress to them this fact. See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. As we sing the song sometimes, come to the feast. And so we understand, of course, the, the, the king here, represents God and that he's inviting people to this wedding. He's inviting people, we, we understand by, by extension of application of the parable, he's inviting people to the glories of heaven and to his kingdom because he says the kingdom of heaven is like this. And they refuse. So he tries again and he stresses the, the beauty, and the wonder, the preparation and all that awaits those who would come. And he says, it's all ready. Just come on. It's yours for the taking. 
The next verse, 5, in Matthew 22, says this. But they made light of it and went their ways. We have that same beautiful invitation to that same beautiful place prepared by our Father. And as we think about that application and that invitation in our own lives right now, this moment, what choice do we make? It says here these people made light of it, and then they went their way. And every day we have that opportunity extended to us, and, and especially right now as we think about the invitation of Christ to obey the gospel, to be restored. Will you make light of it and just go your way? Or will you seriously listen and understand what's being offered? And with a heart full of gratitude and love, take Jesus at his invitation. Would you come tonight as we stand and we sing? Please be seated. Will you bow with me? A holy, almighty, righteous, all-knowing Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for blessing our lives sheltering us from the storms of, the, of life that we have went through last night. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done for us. Father, we need you every hour, every minute. 
Father, continue with us here at Meridianville. Bless us. Help us to continue to grow closer to one another. And we pray especially for the Hogan family. Father, you know their needs. Continue blessing the medical profession that are dealing with them. Help them, Father, to somehow improve their health. Bless them, please, Father. Watch over us this night throughout life. Help us, Father, as we walk through life to, to grow closer to you, grow in faith in you. And Father, when we fail, please forgive us, pick us up, and may we go on. For it's in Christ's holy name. Amen. Good evening. We're glad you've chosen to spend your Wednesday evening with us here tonight. We hope that the Bible study, uh, the devotional, and our fellowship together is a blessing to you. We have some announcements tonight before we dismiss. Ladies, if you would like to go to the Transform Ladies Conference, please give your deposit to Jackie Jones or Jessica Flores tonight. The Old Goats will meet tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall for a time of study and fellowship. The ladies' class will meet tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall for coffee and informal study. Please invite your friends. Ben May's Bible class will meet tomorrow night from 6 to 8 p.m. in the small auditorium. We are studying Paul's prison epistles, and tomorrow night will be the last class. Monday night for the Master will be Monday, April the 8th at 6 p.m. Please sign up at the back table if you will be eating dinner or if you can help with the meal cleanup. And the Young at Heart will start this season with a potluck dinner on Tuesday, April the 9th at 5.30 p.m. in the Small Fellowship Hall. Please bring a dish and join us for good food and fellowship. If you have any questions, uh, please see George or Judy Jolly. In the youth news, those going to Macon Music, the van will leave this Friday at 4 p.m. and return Sunday around 3 p.m. Cost is $50 and bring money for four meals. The K-5 Easter Egg Hunt will be Sunday, April 7th after AM Bible class at Andrew and Becca Henson's house. Please bring a finger food and 12 pre-filled eggs per child. The Young Men's Training class will meet this Sunday, April 7th at 3.30 p.m. in the small auditorium. The Junior and Senior High Devo will be held this Sunday, April the 7th at the building. Please bring a drink or a dessert. Pickup is at 8.30 p.m. And in our prayer request, Macon Hogan's Transplant Day has been moved to Friday, April the 19th. We uh, encourage you please to see the PowerPoint and uh, any bulletins for any uh, other announcements and those that are on our prayer list. I hope you have a great week. If there's no other announcements, we are dismissed.